Okay. Next, we'll move to item number six, which is our legislative session uh, preparation. So we're starting off with Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones. Uh, yes, Chair Huntsman. So in the interest of time, uh, if you could call on uh, School Finance Director Sam Yuri and our MSP Coordinator, Dale Frost, um, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, the first agenda item, which is to essentially update you on progress so far uh, with your requests. Uh, we'll also be including a comparison or crosswalk of the uh, governor's proposal to the legislature that has occurred since your last meeting uh, and, and then some other um, key information or topics as we progress into the legislative session or move together into the legislative session next week. So if you'll call on Sam. Yes, Sam, Sam Uri and Del Frost. Yes, thank you, Chair Huntsman, Sam Uri, School Finance Director here at USBE. It's great to be with you. Uh, I've asked Dale Frost, MSP Administrator, to, to drive here. And I want to recognize, if it pleases the Chair, two guests that we have with us today. That is former USBE Board Member Brittany Cummins, who's now Senior Advisor on education to Governor Cox and senior budget and policy analyst from the governor's office of planning and budget, Jacob Wright. Uh, they are here with us today to, to answer any questions the board may have as we review this, this crosswalk or comparison between the USB's budget uh, requests and, and what was presented in the, the recently released governor's budget. Yeah. Well, yeah. welcome to, to Paul. Uh, they've got to be in the queue here somewhere. So, yes, I believe you. You should see them there, down at the, towards the bottom. But, but we thank them for being here, and and uh, would would invite board members to to raise their hand and and ask questions as we review these items. So, so just one sec, Sam, before we get into this. So are you going to do the overview and then come back for questions? Yes, let's let's do that if that pleases the chair. Uh, we'll present the this information and then we could go back to the action item if if the board has any preference to to update any any of their priorities at this point. Okay. So uh, we will review these items. The the first items are the base budget items. Uh, we have uh, the enrollment growth of $36 million, which the governor also placed in, in his budget. We have the base uh, WPU value, weighted pupil unit value increase for inflation of 2.6%. And the governor also has that in his budget. And we, we also have the Utah Schools for the Deaf and Blind Educator Salary Adjustments of 812000 So uh, the governor's budget uh, agrees with, with the USBE's priorities in, in that regard. And now we'll move to our prioritized requests uh, for appropriation or prioritized uh, budget requests. So USBE has requested above over and above inflation, 5% in add on. Uh, the small difference there is due to the governor's calculation, in, including the, the discretionary in, increase in the weighted pupil unit value. Uh, the governor's budget agrees with USBE priority of uh, full day kindergarten at 22.7 million. Uh, additionally, the governor's budget agrees with USB's priority on reducing curricular and co-curricular fees at five, $55 million. Um, transportation at number five does have statutory increases for enrollment growth and weighted pupil unit value increases. Uh, so both the USBE and governor's budget would include that $6.2 million kind of inherent increase, if you will. 
uh, USBE is asking for $5 million over and above those inherent increases. And that is where we differ with, with the governor's budget. So USBE's total uh, increase in transportation funding would be 14.1 million, whereas the governor's increase would be uh, just the, uh, the 9.1 million. Uh, as far as Beverly Taylor Sorensen Arts in, in all schools, USB has requested 12.5 million, whereas uh, the governor's number um, funds the current program uh, at 600,000. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, so a, a difference there as well. Small district and charter school base funding, uh, we both have 8.6. Uh, next, USBE market adjustments. Uh, there is quite a, a large difference there. Governor's number is a 2% increase. Um, and there are also some cost of living increases that the governor has requested separately. Uh, going to critical USBE FTEs, uh, USBE requested a total of 11 FTEs as part of that business case whereas the governor's recommendation is to fund two of those FTEs, one fiscal monitor, half FTEU PAC investigator, and a half educator licensing uh, FTE. As far as the Center for Continuous School Improvement goes, uh, USB's original request was for 1.7 million, and the governor's recommendation is, is to fund the director position for one year and evaluate before committing to additional funding. Uh, and lastly, the, the flexible educator directed preparation and collaboration time uh, for 30 million uh, is, is not included as a line item on the governor's budget, but could be uh, part of the governor's one time $253 million recommendation um, as we go forward. Um, there are some other differences as we as we go through there, but uh, in the interest of, of time, I'll I'll stop there for for questions that the board members may have uh, for myself or for Jacob Wright and Brittany Cummins. Okay, um, I'm just going to take a, take the liberty before I forget, so I don't get lost in the in the queue. Um, and this will be a question for either uh, Brittany Cummins or Jacob Wright. On our WPU add-on request, I mean, I, I know Gralt is funded and you know, we had Amendment G and, and that was all, all awesome. But uh, in, this, in this space on our W, on that, the difference on our WPU, um, there, there is a war on talent right now. And for LEAs, to deal with that war on talent on their classified employees, their teachers, and that it, it, it with, with everything that's happening with this robust economy, which is all super fantastic, don't, one of the, one of the, about the only way um, to hang on to their, to that talent is um, on the wage side. And the only way to pay that is really through uh, the WPU. Uh, to be able to retain uh, these education um, individuals that, that, right, that have committed in the past to public education, but um, the private sector and even other agencies are, are learning, are kind of not just learning away, they're signing them away with, uh, and we're losing these employees. Can either one of you speak? Um, to that concern and uh, of that that difference, or the justification on the um, two point four. Chair Huntsman, I can speak to that. Okay, good to see you, Brittany. Yeah, it's good to see you. Okay. It's great to be here, Chair and board members. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I, I would have to, to share your concern with um, the inflationary uh, pressures that are being felt by um, school districts across the, across the state. We hear that here at the governor's office as well, both in K-12 education and higher ed um, situations. 
Um, so the governor is proposing a 5% increase, you know, when all altogether that 5% increase on the WPU value is a significant increase. Um, recognizing that based on the revenue numbers that were available, you know, for all of us as we go through this budgeting conversation currently, that um, and recognizing the other um, ongoing needs of educators across the across the state, um, the the governor went with a five percent increase in the WPU, not um, not to minimize or recognize not recognize the needs of LEAs as they have to focus um, on on their staffing as they move forward. Hopefully, with this five percent increase in the WPU, they'll be able to to meet some of those demands. Did that answer your question, Chair Huntsman? Well, I, yes, yeah, it, it's all on the hopeful space, but it's money talks in a lot of these, and with a, a lot of these positions, and um, that's that's what they're losing. They're losing employees. I, right. I hope legislature and that will kind of consider this um, moving forward. But thank you for the re response. I, I I know there's other board members that have questions. I have some additional. Maybe they'll be covered. Um, member Earl, and then I have Member Hanson here in the queue. Hey, Brittany, my question is around the one and a half million for feminine hygiene products. Um, it's been my experience in the past that those items are available at schools already. And usually it's upon asking if you leave it free in the, in the rooms or in the bathrooms, then sometimes those end up um, being used for a variety of things other than you know, artwork or whatever. So I'm just wondering, can you just maybe expand on that just a little bit? Maybe there's some information or research I'm not familiar with. Uh, thank you, board member Earl. Uh, thank you, chair, if I can respond. Yeah, please, Brittany. Okay, uh, yes, this, is, this was an initiative that um, the Lieutenant Governor um, was able to um, work with uh, and to correspond with some of their work moving forward. I think the intent is that that this wouldn't be a, a burden for LEAs to continue to provide these uh, these products for girls in our state um, at, and so that it would be available. I, I don't have any logistical information on how that would be available, but just that the financial burden wouldn't have to be um, held at the LEA level or at the school level. Okay, and most districts are saying this is a burden, they're not able to meet that requirement. I, I'm just wondering, because it seems like that's, um, you know, available already, and it's just maybe a supply type of a thing that they're, anyway, I don't know, maybe this is just the Lieutenant Governor's thing, right. so maybe I'm the wrong person, but right. yeah. And I would just add, I, there's not a current requirement that these supplies be made available to, to girls across the state, and so this is a is a, a movement, um, an organization trying to make sure that they are available and ensuring the LEAs don't have to hold that burden in schools as, as this gets moved forward. Okay, thank you. Chair, can I, can I clarify something on that? Well, you, you've already grabbed the mic, so we'll let you on that particular <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, just, just a point of information. When those supplies are available to students, that's because somebody has personally paid for that out of their pocket. There is not a source of funding for that. So it's a secretary, a teacher, a principal, an assistant principal that has that have paid for those to be available to students. I just wanted to share that. Thank you, um, Member Hanson. Thank you, Chair. And you touched on my concern um, partially with um, the increase in the WPU. I wondered if we could ask our guests maybe to comment on both that, um, where we have, we were losing teachers um, to the private sector um, and USBE staff as well, prior to the inflation that's, that's hit recently. And so now um, with the current WPU, um, I don't think they were even coming close to keeping up with the inflation, which would be status quo at about 7%. But I did see a COLA um, line item that's in the governor's budget that's not in ours. And I'm interested in the interplay between those two, um, if someone could comment on that. Brittany, would that be you or Jacob Wright? I'll let Jacob respond to that one. Jacob Wright, can you join us? Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, Board Member Hansen, uh, as far as the COLA is concerned, you're right, it's not here represented in the sheet, but it's roughly another $1.7 million ongoing to cover a 3.5% COLA, as well as the increased medical costs. There's a 6.7% increase in those costs and a 1% increase. And that's, that's a uniform recommendation across the state and for higher education. Do you have a follow-up? Member Hanson. Oh, so that would be um, the recommendation for all state employees to have that 3.5% COLA? Correct, yes. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. We'll factor You're that welcome. in. We're commenting on the WPU, appreciate it. Um, Member Klein? Yeah, just a quick question again on the, the feminine products. It's, um, Brittany mentioned a, a, an initiative or a group that's behind this? Who is that? Um, Brittany Cummins. Um, I don't have the information right off. I can get that and send that to the board if that would be okay. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, Member Strait. Yes, could we go up to number 11? Okay, so could, could we speak to the note, the 253.7 million for this one, one time? Is that Jacob Wright or? Whoever. I, I can speak to that, Brittany, or, oh, go ahead, Brittany, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, board Member Strait, uh, that particular item, so the governor prioritized $250 million in one time to go towards um, some flexible needs, including capital um, and other items. And so the comment just gets to the point that that's, um, while it hasn't yet been determined how those funds would be um, allocated to LEAs at this point, that could be an opportunity for LEAs to prioritize that as a priority if they have the flexibility within that, that um, pot of money. But like I said before, um, the allocation mechanism for those funds has not been determined yet. That's still a question of priority and policies as we consider how best to get um, that 250 million on uh, one-time monies out to districts. Thank you. Oh, that'll be. And thank you. Uh, Member Booth. I was just wondering if, uh, Brittany, if you could comment <clears throat> or uh, let us know if those who were uh, proposing to the governor what should be done with the uh, Beverly Taylor Sorensen uh, program, um, if they were privy to the white paper that we developed uh, and presented to the board when we made the recommendation that we fully fund uh, for all students in the state rather, all, rather than just doing the 50% uh, that are currently being covered. Okay. Brittany, do you, did you wanna to speak to that? I can and Jacob can follow up as, if he has any additional information. Um, I am not familiar with the white paper that you were referencing, uh, board member Booth, I apologize. Um, uh, I think the recommendation or uh, from the governor's office is that, um, and you can correct me if, if this is contained within that white paper, but um, the concept of the minimum 20% match that a, a board would have, uh, or a, excuse me, an LEA might match with that, uh, looking at the possibility of what that might look like is that's not a um, necessarily in statute set up as a as a fixed um, amount, um, but a minimum amount. And would the board be willing to look at how that might be applied in a cost-effective way across the state uh, to come to a, a conclusion of what it might look like uh, to fully fund Beverly Taylor Sorensen across the state? So. If, if that white paper addresses that, I apologize. I wasn't familiar with that, but Jacob can uh, chime in as well if he's aware of some other pieces to answer your question. Jacob Wright, do you have anything to add? No, I don't think I would add anything. I think Brittany captured it really with the, the current 80-20 split in uh, expected local contribution and statute setting that as the floor 
but in practice, that is uh, the amount expected. Okay. Do you have a follow-up, Member Booth? No, thank you. I, I will get that white paper to you, Brittany, and to you, Jacob, and uh, and uh, perhaps carry on some more dialogue out of this meeting. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, but maybe, um, Brittany, you could speak to, I believe it's item nine. Can we go to nine? On, on was there any research or something, anything done on the governor's side to um, to, to choose to, to fund the two uh, FTEs, the one fiscal monitor and um, the other split the way that it is on the UPAC? Yeah, definitely. Um, we had, diff had some email conversations back and forth. Um, um, some of the requests that were sent forward, um, the FTE um, looking at uh, the school fees one of the things that we considered um, in um, not recommending fully funding all of that was the reduction in possible curricular fees moving forward and the reduced impact um, at USBE on that, but making sure that, that um, a fiscal monitor was included in the governor's budget recommendations to help alleviate that transition as you move from kind of an audit space into a, a maintenance space through your um, fiscal department. And so that was that portion. We did have a email conversation with, um, sorry, names are slipping, Ben <laughs> at UPAC. I'm sorry, Ben, I can't remember your last name. Ben Rasmussen, yeah, right? Yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, about that FTE and he mentioned that 0.5 would be sufficient for that particular piece as well as the educator licensing piece. Um, and so we, we did have some email conversations back and forth as we considered um, that FTE request. And, and Jacob can add to that if he has anything in addition. Do you have anything to add? The only thing I think I would add is two FTEs were requested for the leadership initiative. And that's something that while funding had been provided before funding was pulled back in response to COVID, that funding doesn't exist now. So this in our mind is... Uh, premature. Um, additionally, and this I think we saw with a, with a couple of the FTEs or the funding for a couple of the FTEs requested that they were funded with one-time funding. And I think we're a little bit concerned about FTEs being funded with one-time funding and the board later coming back and requesting ongoing funding for those positions in that it kind of puts the state in a bind a little bit. Okay. The, yeah, I don't know. We're not here to sell anything to try to change anything. We're just here to answer, I guess, um, questions in this space. Um, Member Cannon. Uh, thank you. I want to go back to Beverly Taylor Sorensen and ask the question, you've put $600,000 in there. I think I'm saying that correctly. Is that one-time money? Is that ongoing money to keep the pro to maintain the program at the current level? Uh, is there was there any thought given to addressing the huge waiting list of schools who are seeking to get on this program? I'm just wondering if any of these things were addressed, and I want to know specifically if this is one-time money, is this this ongoing money? Uh, so forth. I'll speak to that and Jacob can jump in if I misspeak at any point. Um, so it, it is uh, ongoing funds uh, to maintain the program as it currently stands. Um, at, and as we were speaking uh, earlier with, um, with board member Booth's question, um, the governor is supportive of the Beverly Taylor Sorensen program. Um, there's no uh, doubt in that um, and the benefit that it has across our state and the children that it impacts. I think it's just this um, line item is, and, and the request from the governor's office is, let's maintain the program and make sure that we understand the, the true cost of expanding it statewide. Um, is there a way to make that request uh, more efficient um, by shifting, possibly shifting uh, some of the burden back to the 
to the LEAs who participate uh, so that it's not, um, the assumption isn't that the, that 20% minimum is how we would fund this program. And so it's mostly um, a, a moment to pause and ask those questions and make sure that as we request that, that funding or that program to be available statewide, that we do so very deliberately understanding um, um, the best way to fund that in the, in the most efficient manner as far as state funding goes. Jacob, is there anything up? you wanted to add? Oh, sorry. Yeah, follow up. Yeah, I'm just, would, do, would you anticipate any pushback if you were to change the uh, required amount for some uh, districts from more than 20% uh, to those that are already getting it with a 2080 split would you anticipate pushback if you suddenly asked other districts to pay more than that? Uh, would it be retroactive to those who already uh, are on the program? I, I see that could, could be sort of a contentious problematic area. Here, may, may I respond? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Board Member Cannon. Um, and, and I guess that's um, the concept that we're trying to get to is is has that question been asked and, and how do we move forward, um, moving forward with it? And so I, um, it would be a, a process of work and study to say, what is the right model to do this? And have we done that in the past? Not that there wouldn't be pushback or a conversation, because I think that would be a healthy um, and important part of the conversation moving forward, but recognizing that, that um, we are at this place because we've just left it at an 80-20 split, moved forward with that assumption that that's the maximum um, match from the LEA. And so let's ask the question and let's uh, be very deliberate in, in a request to make this a statewide program available to all LEAs. Can I just say I'm, I'm grateful for the governor's support of Beverly Taylor Sorensen and uh, we want to do all we can at the state board to be supportive. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Member Cannon. I'm not, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. I appreciate the crosswalk being put together. And every year before we go to the legislature, and that there are some differences. And sometimes people, well, on, well, those that are through appropriations and all that. Of course, they, they, they grill us really good on, on our justification or why we're, where we're um, asking for what we're asking. I don't view it as a competition or anything like that, but we, we, we do value the crosswalk and I know where the, and the, the value, um, there's value in knowing where, where the governor uh, sits in, in priority. So we appreciate all the efforts here. Um, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones, am I leaving anything out here before we sum this up or I can turn as we're summing it up, um, maybe I'll turn this, well, let me hear from Scott and then Brittany and Jacob will give you the last word. Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones. Uh, yes, sir, that, that would uh, subject to, you know, any closing comments by uh, Brittany Cummins or Jacob Wright, uh, that would conclude this portion of the agenda item. We do have an update on uh, another business case that Sam needs to address with the board okay. uh, as part of the first agenda item. But you know, for the most part, we can conclude the crosswalk with the governor's budget. Again, subject to any closing comments by Brittany and or Jacob. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Jones. Uh, Brittany Cummins, do you have an invitation to? Thank you, Chair. Uh, it just want to start by saying it's a pleasure to be here with you as a board today. It's, um, I miss you guys. Can I just say that? Um, but I, I do uh, want to, to say we are um, excited about moving together with you as a board into the legislative session and um, having important conversations and moving together as we collaborate um, in the appropriations process. But we we support you. Um, we are here to be a part of the conversation with you, and we recognize your leadership as, as these conversations move forward into the session. So thank you for this opportunity, and um, we're excited to be a part of, of this. So. Thank you, Brittany Cummins. Jacob Wright, do you have anything you want yes. to add? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity, Chair. I think the first thing that I'd just add real quickly is uh, exp an expression of gratitude for your staff. They're fantastic to work with, and uh, I inundate them with requests throughout the fall, and they're quick to respond and very helpful, and I enjoy working with them. So thank you for employing such great staff. The other thing that I would just quickly mention in passing is Brittany suggested this excitement to go forward with you into the legislative session. Uh, in my eight years in the budget office, I have not seen uh, a comparison between the board's and the governor's recommendations that line up so well as these do. This is the most alignment between them that I've seen during that time. And I would just express a lot of gratitude that the board took the time to prioritize requests that, believe it or not, does help us out and helps the governor out. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you on the Hill. We, we value the process and the opportunity. And we understand that we're, we're a guest up there as we present um, our legislative ask and look forward to working with you as we try to bring betterments to public education. Thank you for your service and being well to meet with us today. Um, you're welcome to stick around for the whole day, Brittany. And I just won't recognize you if you're trying to make a motion or vote. I don't, you know, occasionally I, I think you probably want to shout out all in favor, whether you're I or nay. <laughs> so at least I'm tempted to do that when I'm in other meetings outside of outside of this. I have to bite my tongue. So uh, again, appreciate what you guys are doing and working with us. Um, Deputy Superintendent uh, Scott Jones, we have an, another item on a case, a business case. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Okay. Sam. Yes, Dale, if you can uh, display uh, the 6.1 item. Uh, you know, the board does have an, an action item here. So if there is any uh, reprioritization that that you wanted to happen, I, I suppose it could happen at, at this time, but we do just have a, an update on, on one case and that is, uh, num uh, it's coming up. <laughs> I don't recall the, the number of it, but it's the, uh, the Center for Continuous School Improvement and uh, the update, so it's number 10, I apologize. So the, the update would be to, to add uh, $111,000 to that request. And the, the reason for that was uh, inadvertently, uh, there had been a program uh, director uh, position included there and and uh in speaking with assistant superintendent Voorhees who is Leah Voorhees who is here to to answer any questions you may have uh just to provide the expertise that that we'd want to to carry out this program uh for the center as as we'd want uh, educational director uh, with with additional credentials and experience. Uh, so that would be a difference of one hundred and eleven thousand dollars. Any any questions or clarifications there, uh, Assistant Superintendent Leah Voorhees? So this is coming up through staff that Yes, that's correct. Yes, and the, the staff is asking that that number be changed. There was a proposed motion. Was there not? I apologize. I, the, I guess the proposed motion would be to uh, amend item number 10 to uh, in, increase uh, the the request by one hundred eleven thousand dollars to account for an educational director FTE. May I add to that? So it is not <clears throat> Sam. Uh, it these are two program specialists that were originally included for our support staff, and the request that that came from staff as they were reviewing it 
would be to change those to two educational specialists. And, and the cost and salary between those two uh, position types of the five is the 111,000. And I can give you uh, an exact amount in just a minute. Okay. Thank you, Dale. Okay, that's an opportunity for the board. Um, Vice Chair Belknap. Yes, I'd like to make a motion, Chair. And the motion would be to change the amount on our Center for Continuous School Improvement to uh, a, the exact amount that Dell's going to give us. Second. One, $1,780,500 on note. One seven eight zero. That's the total. Well, it, well, it, that, that, yes, that is the total or an okay. increase of 111,100. Thank you. Excuse so me. Chair, however you want to read that. Well, let's have it. I think it's important that I don't mess this up. So who's our driver that can put this motion on the screen? Dale's currently driving. Let, let me put up the, the document. I was not ready for this. I apologize with, with the motion. I'm sure Deputy Superintendent uh, Stallings is writing this up. One moment. I thought I saw a flash on my screen, a proposed motion, but then I couldn't see it fast enough. So I thought there was already something drafted. I apologize. This is, um, sorry, Deputy Superintendent Stallings. I was stepped away for a moment and was in the hall and then heard my name. So is there- So Angie, we're looking for a motion to be put on the board. Thank you. Oh, it's not a substitute motion. No, that's for later. Okay. I, I make a motion that we in, increase the continuous <laughs> school improvement funding um, uh, $111,000 to, to be what, Dale? And the amount is 101,000, right? 111,100 11. is the Thank you. increase. Thank you. You got that? Well, hang on one sec. So I, that's your motion. Who was the second? Molly. Hart. Okay, you want to speak to your motion while this is being? Um, yes, I do, Chair. Thank you. I, I'll be short, but I would like, I mean, for $111,000, we, we should get this accurate. And so I appreciate them catching this now. Thank you. Okay, discussion to the motion. Um, Member Earl. Yeah, so if I understand it right, the governor's um, reasoning behind reducing the funding is to make sure there's an effectiveness in this program in the first place. Um, I guess that's my question. How often do we get feedback on the actual effectiveness and auditing of this program? if we're gonna to continue to put millions of dollars into it, are we getting the, the outcome that we want? And that's just a question. I don't know if the governor's office has a, uh, an audit or something that they've done or any, no, okay. So it, that's just the question. Do we, do we frequently audit or um, monitor, maybe that's the better word, um, whether or not the progress is being made and our money is well spent here? That's just my question. It's not a criticism. I just want to make sure we're being effective in our usage of funds and outcomes. This, and regarding monitoring this, this, what staff would like to answer that question? Hey, Chair, I think you should, uh, I recommend you call on Dr. Voorhees. Okay, Dr. Voorhees, are you with us? I was looking for a hand to jump up. Yes, Chair, I'm here. Okay, can you respond to the question about do we monitor and for? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Leah Voorhees, Assistant Superintendent of Student Support. So uh, board member Earl is correct. The Center for Continuous School Improvement is new. Um, uh, Tracy has been with us for a year and a half and we have been organizing resources around uh, providing all schools in the state of Utah with 
supports for improvement, not just those schools that have been identified through state uh, and or federal uh, accountability measures to be required to improve. Um, and we are, uh, we are annually monitoring the effectiveness of our supports by um, in, in several ways. Um, we have done extensive uh, surveys and focus groups with our stakeholder groups about the needs that they have and the supports that are being provided and if the supports are meeting the needs. But we are also reviewing all of our uh, accountability measures to determine if the supports that we are providing are actually improving outcomes for all schools. And, and uh, as you said, the center is new. Um, and so um, it will likely take a little while for us to see uh, significant outcomes, but we, we are annually monitoring. You have a, a follow-up, Member Earl? Yeah, I, I, I suppose so just a little bit. I, I, and I, I'm wondering in some regards if we duplicate um, intent or actions, and I, I'm just speaking with the U lead and, and other things, or if we're adding to this. And once again, it's just a question, making sure we're making best use of our resources and everything, um, and making sure we're really hitting where we can be most impactful and allow LEAs, and that is a little bit of a concern I have, is allowing LEAs to decide and engage versus State Board of Education to decide and engage. Does that make sense? So anyways, just some thoughts. We can, we can move on. <laughs> or if, I guess if Tracy has something to say. Um, you have more to say on this, um, Tracy? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Tracy Van Deventer, Director of the Center for Continuous School Improvement. I just wanted to highlight that as we're going through and working with stakeholders and identifying our strategic priorities, one priority that we have created that I think goes along with this is creating an advisory council that we would meet with on a quarterly basis. And on that council, we would have LEA members, we'd have families, we'd have community organizations that we partner with, and that we would bring that group together as kind of a supervisory group that would provide us with feedback specific to the work we're doing, and that we are planning on having to report to them the progress that's been taking place based on what we've committed to. So we're in the beginning stages of creating Creating that advisory council, but that is our plan moving forward. Okay, um, Member Hart, your hand is raised. Yeah, I I support this. I um, school improvement is some of the toughest work in education. Um, it has um, there's links to the federal government. There's um, statutes to be um, complied with. It's it's hard, painstaking work. I support the best uh, and most skilled individuals in, this, in, in, in these positions. And I think it's absolutely necessary in order to not waste uh, money that we are putting towards the initiative. We've got to get it right. Okay. I'm not seeing any, any additional hands raised, so we'll I'm going to call this to a vote. The motion for the board, does the board increase the amount for the Center of Continuous School Improvement Funding request by $111,100 to $1,780,500? All those in, well, uh, board members at this time, please vote. The voting is complete. The motion passes with one no vote, uh, Member Klein. Okay. Um, sure. Thank you, uh, Deputy Superintendent Jones. Uh, yeah, Chair Huntsman, I, that would, uh, subject to Sam saying anything else, I think that we can move off of 6.1. We did. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hang on, Sam. So we, we did 6.1 and then we did the governor's crosswalk. So now um, we'd like to just walk through the executive appropriations committee um, piece or agenda item that you see there. 6.1.2. Okay. 
Right. Yes, sir. Go right. ahead. Which. Right. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Jones and, and Chair Huntsman. Uh, so just informational item here. Uh, as, as you know, uh, December 7th, uh, the Executive Appropriations Committee met um, and we've been in, in basically constant uh, communication with the Legislative Fiscal Analyst Office. Uh, specifically Ben Leishman there, who's who's the finance manager and, and Emily Willis, who both deal with, with education, with public education. Uh, so I guess the, the big takeaway from these um, is that there is a lot of, of revenue and, and specifically one-time revenue in the system as a whole, uh, but, you know that could go a lot of directions and and uh not you know not all of that is is necessarily you see there in in column b that's one billion dollars in in one time net available revenue however that can go you know subject to to legislative processes it, it some of it may go to education but but uh big portions of it may not. So again, uh, there there is lots of ongoing and one-time revenue in the system, but uh, that's subject to, to further legislative processes. Thank you, Dale, if you'll proceed. And this is what, what they call the red sheet. Uh, um, so, I would call out that uh, you know the the base budget does include one um, uh, one unit for the at risk add on uh, WPU, whereas USBE's budget and and the governor's budget um, ha has two uh, two units of appropriation. There um, there is a small update to the item number four, the public education enrollment growth, uh, Ben Leishman has verified that that should be $22 million rather than, than 18. Um, but, you know, at this point, it, it's preliminary. This is the, the base budget. Um, and there's a, a lot more to come. But we just wanted to, to let you know that we're we're tracking this closely. Um, happy to address any any questions that you may have, but uh, we we're keeping a cl close eye on this, and we'll continue to to work with the office of the the legislative fiscal analyst um, as we proceed and and um, our our first uh, public education appropriation subcommittee meeting is is this Wednesday the nineteenth, as you know. Um, so happy to address any any questions or if Dale Frost or, or Deputy Superintendent Jones have, have anything to add at this point. Uh, Director Yuri, if, if I may add uh, a, a couple um, pieces of information that may be um, important for the board. Uh, in this line two, the public education inflation at risk WPU, uh, just to orient you to the other sheet, that includes the 2.6 million increase in the WPU value. The 2.6%, yes. Uh, excuse me, 2.6%, thank you. Not 2.6 million, uh, it's more than that. Um, and uh, the, the budget request is requesting uh, 56 million increase in the at-risk WPU add-on. Essentially half of that is already included in the base budget, just so you, um, and the governor's budget agrees with with the USBE recommendation to add the 56 million, what that would mean in practice would just be an additional, um, you know, 28 million or so. And then I also wanted to point out here in the set asides, so this is not going to be in the base budget, but the Executive Appropriations Committee set aside $72 million um, for additional per pupil spending. If the legislature allocates that, uh, for the WPU value increase, that would be about 2%. So it, but that again, will be up to the de decision of, of the legislature and will not be in the, in the governor's budget or the, the base budget bill. 
Uh, those were two pieces of information I wanted to add. Thank you. Chair Huntsman, if I may. Yes, Scott. Uh, sir, well, our plan is is to walk you through the base budget bill in your next meeting. Um, the base budget bill is still protected, so uh, we'll we'll be able to walk through that with you uh, at your next meeting at your direction, sir. That's all I'd add. Thank you. I I appreciate it's important. You know, the transparency is everything, and that we get what we get before the board and the public as we as we get it. So um, thank you, staff, for bringing this in, informational items before us. I'm not seeing any questions um, at this time, Scott. So. No, sir, that would conclude these agenda items. Uh, so I think the next one is Deputy Superintendent Stallings at your direction, yeah, sir. I agree. So thank, thanks again. Um, well, we'll invite uh, Dep Deputy Superintendent Stallings. I, I know that we're a little bit behind and and sometimes it's you and then sometimes it's recording stopped deputy superintendent hang on one sec our, our recording just stopped on my is it back up staff can you we're not taking any action um right now but let's make sure that's that's still happening i just had it over my speaker, but hopefully it's back up again. I but haven't heard it yet, Chair. I just had it on my speaker say recording stop. Yeah. Jerry? I heard it too. Jerry? But so, Angie. Recording in progress. This is Jerry. Right, there we go. We're back in. Um, Deputy Superintendent Stallings, you're sometimes you're first and Deputy Superintendent Jones has got to condense, but can you uh, give us a little bit of the Reader's Digest version? And then we'll see if we have any questions. Yes. Your... Thank you. We, um, this request for statutory change came very late yesterday, and I apologize for that, but that's because the request has come from our LEAs very late due to the COVID Omicron variant. Um, many of you may know that currently in code, uh, an LEA may convert up to four days of their instructional days or educational service days to, um, to allow their educators to engage in professional learning and prep time. In order to do this, um, the legislature requires that 90 days of notice be given before the beginning of the school year, that the, the school year calendar will be converting four of those days for um, professional learning and prep. We've had a number of our LEAs I, uh, who did not exercise that authority um, last summer and are now finding themselves at a, at a point where they feel their educators either need additional professional learning time or time to maybe uh, prepare distance learning, uh, virtual learning uh, materials, et cetera, and have now requested um, would like to be able to use to one, two, three, or four of those days, but because you have to do that before the beginning of the year, they cannot take advantage of that. So what um, we are recommending or asking if the board would like to support is us reaching out to the legislature to waive the current 90 day notice before the, the beginning of the school year um, for two years. It could be this year and next year, or even just this year, to allow um, and, and exchange that notice requirement to require them to provide reasonable notice um, before they convert those days. And um, so that's a description of the request is that it would change the 90 day notice before the beginning of the school year with uh, requiring LEAs to provide reasonable notice uh, before converting those days. And that's Hang on, but I've lost my view here. Okay, Member Lear, welcome. Thank you, and sorry, I, I was so rusty that I put up my thumbs up before I put my hand up. So um, I just had a question for Deputy Superintendent Stallings, um, if the chair would permit that. Yes, uh-huh. Um, my question, Angie, is, what, 
maybe and maybe this is really a dense question, but I'm trying to understand with our increased um, IT uh, capacity, and I know it's not perfect, but increased, improved, why we felt we needed that. Uh, that's been in board rule for a long time. Why do we need that nine, 90 day notice requirement, period? Chair, may I? Ben Stallings. Thank you. Um, it's actually in code and I, I can tell you my recollection of why that was. I, I actually think I drafted, I believe I drafted the bill that added this language. It was back at around 2009 or 2010 during the recession when um, many line items were cut and the funding was rolled in the WPU. You may remember that. One of the line items was a specific appropriation for educator preparation or educator professional learning. When they cut that line item appropriation, I think at the time it funded essentially essentially four days of professional learning. And so um, instead what they did is they, you see the language here in 4D, um, they provided that ability to, to LEA. So it's been there for 11, 12 years to convert up to 32 hours or four days. Um, and, and this, I can't remember why this notification requirement was put in there, only that, I mean, now um, we're all very flexible because of COVID, thank you, COVID. Um, but back 10, 11 years ago, I don't think it was common for our LEAs to change their schedule uh, or their calendar during mid-year. I, I just don't think it was a practice that was done. The last couple of years, of course, has been a difference. So that's my recollection of the why behind the 90 days. Um, but it it would, I, and it was um, Aaron Osmond, who's the Senate sponsor, who sponsored that bill. And just a quick follow-up, Chair, if I yeah. may. Uh -huh. um, I'm just, it just seems to me that now LEAs do an excellent job of notifying parents of everything. And that seems to me maybe the biggest reason um, for, uh, having been a working mother all my life, as all mothers are, I guess, but um, out of the home, I, it, I, it was helpful to have that notice in advance. Now, I'm pretty sure that LEAs have picked up that responsibility um, four times, so I, four times over. So I, I have no problem with the change, but I'm also, uh, I'm just, I'm wondering why it's even there at all, and, and maybe we should look to rethink that or ask the legislature to rethink that. Um, Member Cannon. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, Sup Deputy Superintendent Stallings said we would change it to reasonable notice. And of course that begs the, the questions, how would you de define reasonable notice? Um, Deputy Superintendent Stallings. I think that is a one of the core questions, and I thought that same thing, even as I was writing it. I think in a pandemic, the reasonable notice is going to be different than if you're in a regular year. Um, so that is, I think, why we put reasonable notice. And, you know, in the pandemic situation, when you have the Omicron variant and you've got a number of teachers or staff who are um, out sick or for whatever reason, I think the reasonable notice would be sh much shorter than maybe a traditional year where we don't have those types of um, variables. So if you, we could do two things. One, we could just request that the, the legislature waive that completely and, and or remove that notice requirement. Or we could provide some more direction as to what reasonable means or, or or put a set day in there, whether it's 30 days or 15 days or something like that. So that's the option. So I also see an option because we don't have a, a motion on the table. And can we bring this back as a national item and let's get that cleaned up that, that word reasonable because I, I don't think it's gonna move out of here or we'll get much traction <laughs> moving forward so we can between now and, and next week um, get that word smithed out a little bit so we can meet the intent of the re request. I'm just curious, you give it, you don't have to answer that right now. Let me see what um, Vice Chair Davis um, question or comment is. Vice Chair Davis. 
Well, I was just going to go ahead and make a motion. I was going to make a motion because um, I don't know if some of the LEAs, I mean, we're right in kind of in the throes of all of these changes right now. Is this timely? The reason they brought it last night, Angie, and you brought it to us is because they're, this is a timely concern and they really need to move. So if, if you're um, okay with it, Chair, I'd be willing to make a motion. I'm, I'm good. I okay. just, we'll just see where the motion goes. Okay. Um, to amend 53F-2-1024D dash dash to waive the current 90-day notice requirement for two years and replace it with a requirement to provide reasonable notice related to an LEA's authority to convert up to four instructional educational service days for professional learning or educator preparation time. And I'll speak briefly to the motion. Let's get a second first. A second. Who is a second? Stacy Hutchings. Who got the second? Hutchings. Okay, thank you. Okay, you wanna to speak to the motion, Vice Chair Davis? Yeah, I just, I think because this is rolling around so quickly, our LEAs are asking for a timely response. And um, while reasonable might be loosely defined for these two years while we're dealing with these strange <laughs> crises that pop up and down, um, the definition for reasonable is going to change. And I think most, most reasonable parents know that. So I think we should move ahead with the language it, since it's a two year change. Any other discussion to the motion? Seeing that, and I'm, I'm okay. There's the consequences that I haven't clearly defined isn't going to disrupt or cause a negative effect um, in public education. I'm, I'm fine with that word. I just didn't know whether the, the, well, we'll find out where the board will go on this. So we have a motion. I'm not seeing any other questions. I'll call this to vote. The motion before the board is that the board amend. Um, 53F-2-1024D to waive the current 90-day notice requirement for two years and replace it with a requirement to provide reasonable notice related to the LEA's authority to com, um, convert up to four instructional educational service days for professional learning of educator preparation time. Board members at this time, please vote. Voting is complete and the motion passes unanimously. Is this how you see it, vice chairs? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Angie. Any other loose hands or is that? You still need to do the questor item on this. Yeah, that's coming back. So um, on my paper agenda, I see that I missed 6.2 which is really a housekeeping item, but it's very significant. It's about transparency and, and doing things correct in the finance world. So it's a quest our settlement funds, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones. Are you gonna brief the board on the opportunity? Uh, Chair Huntsman, this is Deborah. Yeah, are you gonna do it? Yes. So, I believe Scott, uh, Deputy Superintendent Jones needed to step away. Okay. So I'll, I'll take this one. Um, we're seeking, this is obviously an action item. Um, we are, re, we as a state agency are only allowed to spend 125% of our appropriations each year. Um, this $3.3 million that we've received as part of a mediation process with Questar puts us well above that. So we're, um, we need to have the legislature appropriate a supplemental um, for us to move forward and using this in our assessment budget. So if there are any questions. <laughs> okay, hang on, I lost my view again. So, um, Member Earl. So I just have a couple of questions. What do you foresee um, the usage of this or will will there be, is there legislation for assessments that this will, um, they'll say, well, we've got the funding. I'm just trying to figure out the, the legislative um, 
impact. I may not be fully aware of that. So the request would be to return the funds where they were originally spent, uh, where they were originally appropriated to. Um, and by way of the finance committee tomorrow, um, there are some recommendations that will come through the finance committee on how to spend these funds um, in the assessment budget. Did that answer your question? So can you speak a little bit? I think the, the broader question might be that she was asking is all of a sudden we're in receipt of 3.3, well, $3,375,000. So can you speak to how will we, re will we receive that? But yes. then full transparency to taxpayers and everything, those dollars were in this assessment world. So yes. Come in, we need to be accountable to our stakeholders and all the legislature. So this motion, I believe, is part of that accountability piece um, to have it still go into our assessment budget. And instead of we receive this money and it has to have a destination. Can you speak to that? And, yeah. That so way? I okay, I think I understand. Um, yeah, so naturally when we receive these kind of funds, we've, we've already um, placed it in our assessment budget. What we really need at this point in time is to have the legislature um, appropriate it to us as a supplemental in 22 so that we can utilize the funds. Okay, and then my question is, do we foresee, and maybe we can't guess what the legislature is gonna do or see this, but um, Will they view this as being necessary for some other um, item that is that is already being requested? Does that make sense? Are you hearing that? I guess yeah. something like that could happen. No, I I really don't foresee that. I think um, it this is more of a housekeeping type of a thing, allowing us to spend it above our original appropriation. Um, because this takes us well above the 125% that we're allowed to spend, if that makes sense. Um, so it's an accountability piece that we make sure we don't spend above that. Above that restriction. Thank you. Above, yes, above that restriction. Does that help? But I haven't heard, I don't anticipate. Could they? Yes, they could say that um, they want it. Um, used for other purposes, but I don't foresee that. Um, Vice Chair Belknap. Yes, I'd like to make a motion, Chair, um, that the board approves the motion requesting the legislature appropriate the 3,375,000 for an FY 2022 supplemental to the USBE for the purpose of assessment. I second it, board member Booth. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. You want to speak to the motion? Vice no, Chair. thank you. Debbie did great. Deborah did great. Okay. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, I'll restate the motion and then we'll vote. The motion before the board is that the board uh, that the board approve them. Um, let's say how do we put it? that the board approve a motion requesting that. Is, let me see how you state it. You stated that. The, that the board approve the legislature appropriation appropriate. I don't have it in front of me again, and it's not reading right that I just wrote around. That the board approve the motion is that the board what? Okay, that the board approves uh, the request that the legislature appropriate the three point three million three hundred seventy five thousand for an FY twenty twenty two supplemental to the USBE for the purpose of assessments. Okay, the motion for the board of the board approve the legislature appropriation, appropriate the 3,375,000 for the fiscal year 2022 supplemental to the USBE for the purpose of assessment. Did I state that correctly? Yes. Okay, um, members at this time, please vote.
the voting is. Did we get a second? Did I miss a second? Uh, board member Booth. Board member Booth. Okay. Sorry, thank you. The voting unanimous, is Jeff. complete and uh, the voting's unanimous. Is that how you see it? Yes. Right, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, let's, I, I think we're gonna kind of get back in rhythm here back um, on our agenda. I believe the next item is number seven. Is that how you guys see it, vice chairs that are following, following this along? Seven is so far done. Let's just move right on. Who needs lunch? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're, we're good to adjust ourselves. <laughs> so uh, it is 1.30, we'll be back at two. Let's, we'll get right back into our agenda. Quick Thank one. you, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> 